Hello, my name is Ellen Koshland. I actually would love to just tease out a little bit of this thing around restriction because um, I was lucky enough, first of all, to see Chinese art at the Saatchi Gallery. And when I walked in, I was knocked out, first of all, by the quality of imagination. And I feel that that is profound in all the Chinese work I've seen. It's highly individual and between people. And so, I mean, I don't think you can get a more unrestricted piece of work than that fuck you picture. And I would wonder if there aren't some payoffs, because in our society where supposedly it's very unrestricted, first of all, I think there is art fashion that is very restrictive on people, but second of all, where it's supposedly, there seems to me a loss of energy that possibly when you show the open door policy through a metaphor, when you use imagination, there's a quality that is of huge benefit to the art. So I guess I, I, I'm wondering about, if you really think about restriction, um, how much is there also a plus and a minus of working around um, supposed tenets of um, prohibition? Indeed, it's the old argument, it's a very old argument related to this, is, is when everything is possible, nothing really happens. And when things are not possible, true, true creative is possible or easier. It's an argument made much easier by us who live in a completely unrestricted environment and um, it's also one that leads very easily to a, a certain type of condescension to Chinese artists who do, regardless of my, my own views of the, of the political problems in China, live with real restrictions. You try and do certain things and you will be closed down, you will be jailed, you will be banned, your work will not be available. That's a reality. Now, if that energizes many other artists and we indulge and enjoy their energized artistic creativity, that's very nice for us, it's very nice for them. But we are talking about the freedoms and possibilities of the spirit without fetter and that we can enjoy the possibilities of a restricted society in a, a Saatchi environment or a, a Western cultural environment is, is fascinating and delightful. I am more interested in the more absolute possibilities for those artists and creative figures who aren't always free and don't even know what the freedoms are. I've known over the last 35, 40 years of my life um, artists and writers whose lives have been destroyed by their attempts to express things that are not possible. And there are generations of them. And there are young people also who suffer from this. Um, Weiwei was in America. He produced this work in America. There's, also, there's, a, third, there's a third panel um, to a later, work, later version of this work with Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Harbour, and him sticking up his finger in the Hong Kong Harbour. I used this as an image, actually, in a book I did 10 years ago. And Weiwei is one of those wonderful figures who actually has become a bellwether for China. He's the only artist who is so outspokenly critical of the Chinese government, who is not banned or, or harassed by the authorities. In fact, those of us who've known Weiwei, for, I've known him for 30 years, I knew his, his father was a very well-known Communist Party member, and I think Weiwei is one of those fascinating and delightful characters who's also, also wonderfully cynically um, manipulated and, and found a way to, to cope and live with China, and the Chinese authorities, one speculates, and people in Beijing speculate that his freedom is possible because the authorities decide we need one or two. We need one or two to just show how free we are, so we'll leave them alone. But we'll control and tell the others how free, how they're not that free. So again, I, I, it's, a very, it's a complex situation. We can delight in restricted freedoms of the Chinese who produce a sort of energized art. But is that not a problem for us as well, to be aware of, oh, their art is interesting because it is the result of a type of a repression, and that brings out a certain type of creative energy. That's true, but at the same time, it also helps us reflect back on what our freedoms have deprived us of, perhaps. So it's a, these, one easily gets into philosophical ruminations, but it's a very complex problem that you've raised, and I can't answer it too easily in this short. I wrote a whole book about this subject called In the Red that tries to talk about just this problem, and it's extremely difficult. I mean, I, Chris, I might just make one quick comment, and that is that not all of the, the works, of course, are shown in China. They're not all exhibited in China, like the, the Yue Minjun execution, you know, painting. That has never been shown in China. I mean, and so it's just not possible. So the things that we see in the Saatchi Gallery or, you know, overseas um, collections or exhibitions, um, just because they're there doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they were exhibited or can be exhibited openly, you know, in China. Um, and having said that, you know, the situation there has changed 
dramatically, but it's still not possible to show everything. Now, there's a question in the middle there. There we go. Um, just a basic uh, question uh, to Jeremy. Um, uh, it, um, the presentation is about contemporary Chinese art. Um, exactly, historically, um, how do you frame or how do you set the, um, uh, how do you say, the, uh, the what, what sort of time frame does contemporary here um, include? And then in terms of Chinese art, contemporary Chinese art, um, all I've seen is actually um, paintings and some other installations. Um, so is this, are these the contents of the presentation you made? Well, I, I think that the brief that we had is to discuss the art that has um, risen since the initiation of what's called the Open Door and Reform Policies of 1978. So can, we have spoken today about the art of the last 30 years. If you speak in Chinese about contemporary Chinese art, that's a whole other discussion because time is delineated differently in Chinese. Contemporary Chinese art in China, the People's Republic of China, not Taiwan, not Hong Kong, is art produced after 1949. That is art produced under the aegis of the Chinese Communist Party and its People's Republic of China. That's called Dang Dai Yishu. But we've, not, we've discussed a contemporary art as delineated from the opening up and reform policies of 1978. For me, modern, I'm more interested in the whole flow of modern Chinese art from the 1880s to, to now. But that's a whole other discussion that we just haven't had time for. I mean, it, it, if I could just add, um, you know, the, what we haven't touched on at all here is um, Russian ink painting, you know, traditions of Chinese painting that is continuing in the contemporary period. But um, in China, it has not been um, included, really, fully, within uh, the definition of contemporary Chinese art practice, which has tended to look to the West and, you know, be regarded as West-looking, so-called avant-garde, you know, experimental art practice as opposed to traditional practice. So that has been the thrust of, of the contemporary art movement in, in China. But now there is a tendency, you know, to broaden that and realise that, in fact, what China has to offer, you know, is, is much greater than that. Oh, there's a question down the front. OK, thank you. Uh, as a Chinese, I always feel very, you know, painful to, you know, when I look at the contemporary Chinese art. Because maybe, you know, the first time when I, you know, saw those, you know, pictures, especially, you know, by Fang Lijun, you know, with those, you know, you know, you know, person with those faces, you know, weird color, you know, you know, that pink color and the shining oil painting, I always feel painful because, you know, once you crack the code, you know, it's just, you know, like, you know, all the, the, the real life or the, the real feeling of Chinese people or, you know, the, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, nervous. Uh, just, you know, uh, how Chinese people's life really is, you know, we are forced to laugh and we are forced to do something and, you know, it's just like a person is made of china or porcelain. There's no inside, no soul, no real life. I always feel painful. Um, but anyway, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's good for those artists. They try to find, uh, you know, their language to express their feelings to the Chinese culture or, you know, in a certain force, you know, the, you know, the life in a certain time. Uh, and thank you very much, you know, for, you know, collecting Chinese, you know, you know, paintings and uh, try to, you know, show, you know, Chinese culture to, you know, Australians. Uh, but uh, may I ask, you know, is there a negative part, you know, for the way you, for the, you know, people who collect, you know, paintings? You know, because, you know, we can see you just, you know, collect, you know, the, the works, you know, a, you know, by a certain, you know, painters or, you know, in a certain way. 
Jeremy, do you want to tackle that one? Because I think you've touched on some of those contradictions in your... I'm happy to... Mm. Do you want to say that? Well, I think not everything that I showed was is stuff that we, you know, that has been collected in Australia. Um, what I really wanted to do was, in a very short space of time, cover through selected artworks, you know, a, um, you know, an artistic kind of, you know, journey, you know, that has been, um, you know, that can, that can um, explain uh, the kind of practice that has been um, undertaken by key artists you know, over the last 30 years. So I guess um, they're all major figures and they're major artworks included in major exhibitions. So I guess um, I've exercised you know, some you know, curatorial kind of choice in, in, in putting that together, but, um, and I wasn't particularly looking you know, to, to represent um, you know, contemporary Chinese art you know, um, and artist's view of, of contemporary culture in a in a bad light, but I mean it's just sort of how it is. <laughs> but just like, I mean, but in 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 the questioner's comments and your earlier mm. response to the previous, is there a risk that there is really an enormous gulf mm. between a, 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 the the artwork as circulated, viewed, collected, bought, say in Australia, and a similar motif viewed? In China, I mean, I, I felt that thread through you, both of your presentations, that there were really almost two dimensions, you know, two universes there, and, and, and artists and objects that traverse the two, meaning entirely different things in each. Mm. Mm. Do you want to have a go? Well, in, indeed, and it's in the past they were completely bifurcated. In China, I, in the 1980s, one could speak of there being virtually a, a culture of the foreign salon because Chinese artworks were only shown in diplomats' apartments or by businessmen and businesswomen, people who bought and exhibited works only for themselves. It was entirely a foreign art market feeding off underground dissident Chinese art. That's changed dramatically in the last 25 years or 20 years or so. And in recent years, you've seen more and more Chinese critics and more and more Chinese entrepreneurs and, and, and buyers enter the market and actually begin to develop collections within China and allow this work, not all of it, as Claire was saying, a lot of Yeo Min Jun's work is unseeable in China, as is a lot of other work, but there are more and more opportunities for this work to uh, uh, circulate within China and become part of the, the, the complex cultural conversations within China itself. But that's a relatively recent, relatively recent development mm. and there's a, lot of, there's a lot that will happen in the next five to ten years. But it is, we've, we've seen this very, these two entirely different art audiences and markets gradually growing closer mm. together in, in recent times. And indeed, if you, if you look, for example, at Lu Peng's book mm. on um, history of 20th century Chinese art, virtually every image that I showed you today you know, mm. has come from that book, is in that book. I mean, it is the art history that is, is, is being you know, written about, um, recognised, you know, as, as you know, the recent art history. Um, and I think, as Jeremy says, they, that has come together. But I think there is a great disjunction um, and there is yet another kind of world of art making, you know, that is um, other than what is regarded as avant-garde, you know, which isn't particularly well documented or understood, you know, in the West. If I could also add to that, in, in keeping with that, there's a Chinese official state-controlled and sponsored art mm -hmm. production in every area. And there's masses and massive amounts of oil painting and, and other and sculptures and so on produced under the aegis of um, the Ministry of Culture and its various bureaus throughout the country, far in excess of anything, any of the avant-garde artwork. Tons and tons and tons of work. And within that, there's a great deal of talent, there's a great mm. deal of variety. And we to that that art is invisible to us because it's simply its official state art, therefore it disappears. And perhaps 10, 20, 30 years from now, there'll be major international exhibitions of that type of art yeah. that has been completely occluded by this avant-garde art. And that'll be a fascinating thing to see, because now in recent years, people have begun to recognise the official art of the 1950s and 60s as being a valid part of Chinese art history. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the same thing will be happening in the future of the art that's being produced today. And many of the artists whose work I mentioned, they're all graduates from the key art academies in China. I mean, they're serious practitioners, acknowledged as. Mm. I think we've got time for one more question, and I can see a hand up at the back there. 
Hi, Jane Brownrigg. Um, from what you've said, I'm just wondering if there's a sense of a kind of symbiosis that the um, avant-garde artists need the Western spotlight for a kind of protection so that they can't be disappeared and whether they in turn sort of focus their artworks to things that they imagine the West might be interested in and if that has sort of had any kind of lasting or profound effect on what they focus on and why. Well, indeed, you've touched on one of the most complex elements of contemporary Chinese artistic practice from the 80s onwards when um, a lot of international artwork was introduced or reintroduced into China through publications and exhibitions. Robert Rauschenberg's visit to China in 1985 had a profound, extraordinary impact on China and the growing awareness of Chinese artists um, of the international, not only marketplace, but first the international exhibition space and catering to the international audience, just as Chinese filmmakers, to a great extent, um, in the 1980s, 85, 6, 7, 8, really did pander incredibly to a small group of international um, film festival directors. I, I, know, I know many of those directors and know the, the artists who were, were pandering to their tastes. But it's been, so there has been that symbiotic relationship, and it's been profound and complex. But in, that's changed dramatically in the last 10 or 20 years because you have... Um, exhibitions in Hong Kong and Taiwan and the rest of Southeast Asia and Asia generally, uh, the biennials throughout the world, you have a, a lot of complex interactions between uh, Chinese-based practitioners in the international market and that symbiosis has become far more complex and subtle. And there's also the biennials in China that are curated and run by Chinese and international curators. So what was a fairly simple and obvious type of relationship in the 80s has become far more nuanced and complex. Though, as you, as you just mentioned, there are these very, very difficult lines of delineation that one has to follow if one really wants to understand how a certain artist produces and evolves a style. And then one can, as one's seen with Claire's comments, how they've developed also, a, many artists have developed a very unique voice that originally reacting to the international market has also grown and developed into something mature and completely of itself. Mm. Yeah, Johnson Chang, you know, Zhang Songren, who uh, ran, runs Han Art Gallery, you know, in Hong Kong, has played an incredibly important role in bringing uh, contemporary Chinese experimental artwork, you know, to international audiences. Um, and that suited the Chinese, or, you know, the Chinese artists in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, because it was what they wanted. They wanted international exposure. And Johnson, through his exhibitions in Hong Kong, and they travelled to Sydney, and they've gone all over the world, um, created quite a stir in the, in the, um, in the 1990s. But as time has gone on, um, there has become a disenchantment. Chinese artists and curators and gallery people have become increasingly disenchanted with the West and, you know, that whole relationship and wanted greater ownership of it themselves. Um, 1993 was the first year that Chinese artists were included in the Venice Biennale. And it was the same artists, pretty much, that Zhang Xiaogang had launched onto the international stage, you know, out of Hong Kong. Um, and they, it was um, uh, Olivia, um, Achille Bonita Olivia, who curated that Venice Biennale and included contemporary Chinese artists for the first time. The Venice Biennale, the 53rd Venice Biennale is on now, um, and China now has an official national pavilion. They have... Uh, for the last three years. Um, and there also is also a, an invitational exhibition that was uh, curated by Lu Pong, who I mentioned, who wrote this impressive history of 20th century Chinese art. He's curated it in association with Olivia. Um, and so it's quite interesting. Um, on the, in the Chinese sort of press releases, there's no mention of Olivia, it's just Lu Pong. But Olivia is there as, a, as an old friend of China who was the first person to actually introduce uh, contemporary Chinese artists to the international um, audience. But with the Venice Biennale this year, um, the China official pavilion um, and also this invitational exhibition, um, pretty much it has the hands of um, you know, Chinese artists and curators all over it, but also of Chinese officialdom. Um, 
So look, it is, it's a very um, interesting you know, situation now. Um, you know, Chinese artists and curators and gallerists have wanted to wrest control of the interpretation of their own art, and great. I mean, I mean it was just that people in the West were fascinated and had opportunities to, to assist with that promotion. Now that situation, you know, is, as Jeremy said, has become more complex, I think you know, it'll be very interesting to see um, what happens. One of the key elements, ironically, of, the, of this invitational exhibition, which was supposed to be a, a non-official Chinese exhibition, was a traditional Chinese garden, you know, a, a traditional Chinese garden, and the artworks were arrayed around this traditional Chinese garden. You know, so, you know, there, and, the, and the exhibition was called A Gift, a Gift to Marco Polo. So there is this desire to, for Chinese to engage in an international dialogue, you know, in reverse, as it were, um, but to put something of traditional Chinese culture at the heart of it. So I think we're seeing an interesting shift in terms of the emphasis of contemporary Chinese art and an opening out of what that might be, and that, I think, is part of a greater Chinese official involvement, but also a, uh, um, a greater awareness of the, of the um, sort of unofficial players' um, understanding, you know, that there needs to be a coming together of these various worlds. Well, thank you, Claire. That's pointed us well, well and truly in the direction of the future. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been to Venice. I'll cash in that plane, plane ticket and not go now. Uh, th thank you, Jeremy and Claire, f for your comments and for your very generous responses to the questions. And thank you to the audience for your attention and your uh, very uh, astute dialogue with the speakers. Will you join me in applauding our two presenters? <laughs>